and welcome to the Lyman Lipke Guitar Cast Q&A edition. Uh, we're answering some questions today, uh, but and I've been like putting off doing this. I'm just in one of those moods. Um, my the most recent uh, distraction I've made for myself is I was t talking to somebody in a comment section of something completely unrelated. And he asked me how to play a chord, which, which I'm almost positive was, um, like, it was a joke ask. Like, middle finger uh, on B thumb on uh, the ninth fret, and then uh, uh, something like uh, this. Um, and, and so, to distract myself, I've been thinking, what is this chord? Um, there's actually a better way to play it, like, um, uh, like, if you're ever gonna play this interval across two strings, swap them. This is the ninth fret of the E string and the second fret of the A string. Ninth fret of the E string is equal to fourth fret of the A string. Second fret of the e A string is equal to seventh fret of the, uh, E string. So rather than playing this, I can play this. And it's actually possible for my my hand to grab that. Um, so that that's the first uh, inclination that this was a, a, a troll uh, chord. Um, and. Uh, to, to remind everybody, if you're an audio listener, I am posting these podcasts on YouTube so you can actually see how screwed up my hands look I'm trying to play this chord. Um, and if you're a, a video watcher, if you want to listen to these podcasts on the go, you can find them anywhere uh, you find your, your podcasts. Um, back to the chord. So he asked what diminished scale. Uh, he could use with that chord and the first thing I thought like that oh, it's not a diminished type chord if anything it's got a sharp five in there so there are a couple of a uh, couple of names um, G add sharp nine sharp 11 over B We've got uh, B in the bass, G, D. That's a G chord. We've also got this note, B flat, A sharp. We call it a sharp nine. Um, this chord is actually used in the Wild Giant song, uh, I Wish I Was a Man. Um, uh, Uh, that's what Austin played on the record. He, he was doing that to try to come up with something cool to confuse me. Um, well, the lead line I played was... No confusion here. Um, I just thought of that this as dominant chord. Um, I'm getting sidetracked already. It is one of those days. Brain ain't working too good. Um, so, B... The sharp nine there's another G here um, and then we've got this C sharp so um, that's the sharp 11 if you were to think of this chord in reference to B um, uh, we've got B minor um, so root minor third major seven natural nine sharp five so B minor major nine sharp five. And then my 
my next thought was, is there a scale that this chord comes out of? Um, so, you know, I played my... It doesn't come out of that one. This is melodic minor scale. Melodic minor is one of my favorite scales. Um, so I thought, maybe harmonic minor. There's the B. There's the C sharp. There's the D. This E note doesn't appear. This F sharp note doesn't appear. This note does, however, appear. The um, and harmonic equivalent to G natural. I think it is G G natural in the harmonic minor scale. And then uh, A sharp. So and these two notes are just uh, double notes. Or this note is a double note. This is the minor third. So B minor major nine sharp five right out of the B uh, harmonic minor scale. Um, trying to catch me slipping. I can figure this stuff out. Maybe. Um, so, B harmonic minor. Um, uh, so you, we could almost think of this chord as like a sus chord. Like these are the suspended notes. goes from uh, just resolves nicely to B minor um, what if we think of it as like um, you know B minor uh, relative major is D um, so if we think of this chord as like a predominant chord to A7 altered D major. Um, uh, uh, so there are possible applications for that. Um, and maybe that inspires one of you. Like, I feel the, the inspiration spark tingling a little bit, um, seeing where I can shoehorn that chord in. Anyway, how you, how you guys all doing? Um, I hope you uh, enjoyed the last uh, episode uh, posted just a few days ago. Um, we're going to be doing this a lot more um, to help out with the, the YouTube channel. Um, and, and if you're, you know, an audio listener, go subscribe to the YouTube channel. But I just uh, thought I'd answer questions once a week. And um, I put the feelers out on Instagram, and I've got some, some great little questions. Um, so let's jump into that, answering your guitar questions. Um, best advice for strengthening wrist and grip on the fretboard i think that that <clears throat> this question is worded very very um dubiously um your wrist doesn't need any strength at all it just exists if you're doing this and uh for the audio onlys uh, I'm, I'm bending the wrist um it's gonna make everything uh work harder um as far as gripping the strings, you do not want to squeeze. If you're squeezing, you have made an error. Um, you're going to tire yourself out. There's too much tension. So, uh, best advice for strengthening wrist and grip on the fret fretboard, on the fingerboard. I'm going to re-phrase uh, uh, that question into how do I hold the strings down and what should my wrist be doing? I've got my guitar at like a 45 degree angle. It's the, the headstock is, is po pointing uh, almost up to the ceiling. Because of that, I can keep my wrist straight, bring my arm down on the guitar, and let the weight of my arm and gravity hold down the strings. My thumb is not making contact with the back of the neck. 
I'm playing bar chords. So, so using the weight of your arm to your advantage is uh, helpful. Like the, the, like your arm already weighs something. Like why not use that to, to help you out? Um, and keep a straight wrist. Like that is very important. So for video watchers, grab your arm, your your left arm or your fretting arm, and wiggle your fingers with a straight wrist. Now bend your wrist and feel all the muscles that are moving. They're working a lot harder when you bend the wrist. So if you keep the wrist straight, they don't have to work as hard. Less chance of injury. That's very, very important. Te my, my view on technique is, is twofold. Two things. One, most important, so you don't hurt yourself. Because if you're hurt, you shouldn't play the guitar. Because it could just keep ag aggravating the injury. Um, rule number one, if it hurts, stop. Uh, unless you're in, you know, a major touring band and you have to play every night, then, you know, you got to look into some other options. But for, for the average bedroom guitarist or, like, weekend warrior guitarist, if it hurts, stop. And, uh, you know, and there, there are exceptions to every rule. If it's skin pain because uh, you haven't played for a little while and your your, your fingers are, are soft and sensitive. Like that, that's an example of, of pain that is just the nature of the beast. It's, that's going to exist. Um, practice through that, build the calluses up, it won't hurt so much anymore. Spider chord tutorial um, is the next question. Um, I, I did the spider exercise a couple times. Um, If I remember right, it's something to that effect. For dexterity and finger independence. Um, if that's what you're talking about. There's also the Dave Mustaine spider chord thing, but I have no idea what the, what the hell he's talking about. Um, I, I'd rather, like, this doesn't sound like... music that I want to listen to. So rather than play something like that, I'd, I would try to come up with some sort of exercise that uh, plays chords where you, you have to move the fingers around creatively that is also musical. Um, and, and so for, for, for this, my mind instantly goes to the Book of Barry Harris, the six diminished scale and borrowing notes. So concept, the six diminished borrowing. <laughs> That's your six diminished scale. Two chords. C6, D diminished, and then the inversions. Any one of these chords, we can borrow notes above or below um, from the we can borrow notes from the chords above or below. So if I'm on this particular C6, which sounds a lot like A minor seven, because it has the same notes. Um, I could borrow notes from this chord or this chord, the diminished chords that surround it. So one cool thing I like to do is borrow above on the top string and then below on the low string. That gives me something like this. And then I'll play the intended chord. I'll do that for every shape. Next chord is And, and now I'm, I'm 
lost. There we go. It gives us cool, like almost modern sounding voicings, and some voicings that we, we should be familiar with, like this. Um, Think of that as a minor 11 chord, G minor 11, or G7, sus4. Um, all sorts of, of, of possible um, borrowing combinations above and below and uh, in different voice voices. And like, you can do that on all the string sets as well. So those are, like, th there are some chords in there that are very applicable musically. Um. I, I feel like that's a better exercise than um, spider chords. Because um, Victor Wooten said something in, in a video that I, I found on YouTube in, like, 2006. This, this video was like one of my, my Bibles. Um, like, he doesn't want to play uh, scales or an exercise if it's not musical. Like, he wants to make music. And, and so, any exercise that I do, I, I want it to be musical. I want it to sound like music. So, that's that question. Um, a little interlude. I, I want to do this for all the podcasts, talk a little bit about the guitar that I'm playing. I am currently playing Butters, the Butterscotch Yellow Strat, uh, Franken Strat, uh, Strat, it's Tully, I'm an idiot, um, it's a Telecaster it, the, that started its life as a Glary, uh, I swapped out the pickups, um, and, and a few different necks have been on this guitar, um, I took the original Glary neck and defretted it, and so that, that it's a fretless neck now, and that's was on this guitar for a little while. Um, my I traded a uh, Schecter 7 string for a Fender neck, so I put that on this guitar, but right now I've got a Lion neck from a, a, a Lion Stratocaster. It's, a, it's actually right there um, that I put a fretless neck on and swapped the pickups out of. Um, I like this guitar. Um, I, I wired in a dummy coil so it's not as noisy. Yeah, like a great jazz telly uh, for, for, for my purposes. Um, and, and the original body cost me like 50 bucks. I've, I've only got like $140 into this guitar. Um, and, and it punches above its pay grade. Does it punch great? Probably not. But um, it's, it's serviceable and in a steal for 140 bucks and somebody who likes tinkering with stuff. Next question. Uh, what would the uh, what would be the advantages slash dis disadvantages of three notes per string versus box scales? And by box scales I'm assuming that they're like the caged fingerings or the Jimmy Bruno's five fingerings. Um, advantages for three notes per string. The same thing happens, uh, the same number of things happen on every string, regardless of um, what position you're in. So if I'm starting C major on F, there's going to be three notes on every string. So that's consistent. I, I, I can have a consistent motion in the right hand. Um, I don't have to adjust for, for where I'm at 
on the the, the guitar. Um, another advantage is, is it's um, a complete uh, picture. Like I'm not missing anything from any of my positions except like those notes on the um, uh, E and B strings. Um, so I'm hitting all the notes and all the frets in, in the key of C. I'm doing, and I'm doing the same number of things um, on on each string. Disadvantage, it's more positions. It's seven positions, um, which is more than the five of the caged system. So that's kind of a disadvantage. Another disadvantage is the stretch when playing a major third. Um, Jimmy Bruno, my hero, is not a fan of this. He says anytime you have to put um, a space between any of the fingers, um, something's going to get screwed up. But, you know, he used more colorful language to describe that. So I've remedied that a little bit by thinking of any time I have to play a major third, um, I'm keeping the hand shape mostly the same. I'm just extending the first finger back. So third, fourth, and, and, and uh, second fingers, second, third, and fourth fingers, they are, um, nothing changes. I'm, I'm not doing anything really weird with my wrist. I'm only doing one weird thing, and that's just reaching back with my index finger. And I've had all sorts of practice with that in my my life because I like to point at stuff. And your your index finger, like it, it can move around pretty good. So an extension. But living here, like just being in this shape all the time, is probably not the the greatest thing. Like that's probably gonna hurt, um, cause injury. So as soon as you can get back to the one finger per fret um, shape. Another thing you can do is like pivot, shift. Just moving everything. So this is my my hand shape, one finger per fret, um, and then I move the the entire mechanism up one fret. So three, five, seven. Then I'd have to move back down to the third fret on the A string, come back into this shape, and then shift again. That's a lot of extra movement, though. So, however you want to um, conceptualize that. Advantages to the the box shapes. They're all like one finger per fret, so they're very comfortable. Uh, uh, another advantage is only five of them, which is less than seven. Um, other advantages, there are chords that go along with these um, scale shapes. Allegedly. Um, like this position would be like the G shape, I think. And, and that was a disadvantage to me because it was always confusing. Like, I couldn't remember, like, like, oh, this fingering, what chord comes from here? Is it E? Like, because I start on E, or, you know, I have all the chords available here. Um, All chords available at all, all, all times, but like these are you know open shapes specifically. Like this is still a D shape to me, even though. So I guess this fingering would be the um, D shape. Um, and then uh, what would this be? G shape, A 
shape. Wow, I finally figured it out. You watched me figure it out in real time. So, um, if my dys dyslexia brain can figure it out, like, I'm sure y'all can figure figure that out. Um, so that's an advantage. Like, there there are chords that correspond to the positions. Um, one disadvantage to me is there's back and forth shifting. So um, my first finger is hovering above the second fret here, and then I shift up to the third fret. That's fine. Like I get to one spot and then I shift shift. But then for the G shape, my first finger is at the fifth fret. And now it's going to be at the fourth fret and then back to the fifth fret. Um, so so that's always a little bit confusing to me. Like where do I put the shift? Like how do I remember that? Um, it wouldn't have been that hard to figure it out. Um, but uh, I, I guess I just got bit by the three note per string bug and that it took me there. Uh, another disadvantage to me is a different number of notes. Um, like it's not always the same number of notes on all the strings. Like in this G shape, three notes, three notes, two notes. Three notes, three notes. Three notes. So, that can very much trip up your, your right hand. Um, I'm an economy picker, primarily, so it doesn't really matter to me. Um, whenever I'm changing strings towards the floor, it's downstroke. Whenever I'm changing strings towards the ceiling, it's an upstroke. So down, up, down, down, up, down, down, up, down, up, down, down, up, down, down. Got that? Remember that? Good. Of course, I never expect anybody to, to, to remember that. Like, I'm not thinking about that. Like, it's just, you know, when I ch alternate picking until I change strings. And then going towards the floor, downstroke, going towards the ceiling, upstroke. Um, I pick whatever fingering system you want, uh, just as long as you have a system. Like that that's uh gonna be very helpful for some of the other questions on here. What has my been my em most emotional response to a piece of music? Uh I'll have to think that think about that one and get back to you next week. What is my best example of perfect practice? That's a great question. Uh focus. Really thinking about m minimizing the movement, not making any mistakes, playing everything uh, slowly and cleanly at first, uh, and even at first, and then... able to control the dynamics um, if, if it's a general exercise if, if it's a specific passage of music that has a sort of dynamic marking or a dynamic idea like really nailing that idea um, and if you make a mistake make sure you s stop and, and, and run that part as small as you can like 10 15 times and then try to add what's on either side rather than practicing the same mistake over and over again but repeating all the parts that you're good at um, that's pretty close to, to perfect practice um, just not wasting your time all right um, how can a player tell what mode a melody is in that is a good question You've got to be able to figure out what notes are in the melody. 
Um, here is a uh, good melody, which is, is in a, a not a very common mode. Um, if I can remember it. So, can you identify the um, notes in that melody? And if so, can you put it in a scale? So I've got a C, a D. Well, I don't have a D. I've got a C, an E, an F sharp, a G, an A, and then at the end of the melody, a B flat. I'm, I'm just going to assume that's D natural there. So... I've put that melody to uh, its its tonal center. Now, uh, let's read it out. Uh, C, D, E, F sharp, G, A, B flat, C. Um, if you studied your modes, um, you know it's probably related to Mixolydian a little bit because there's. It sounds real major to me. Major third, fifth, major triad there, and a flat seven. So that's some sort of mixolydian or dominant scale. It's also got an F sharp in it, um, which is the raised fourth, which um, keep losing my ears. Sorry. Um, which is a Lydian concept, like, so, Mixolydian Lydian, or Mixolydian sharp four, or, or, or Lydian flat seven, commonly called Lydian dominant, um, and that, that's a mode of the melodic minor, uh, what melodic minor? G melodic minor. So I could play that same mode over an F sharp 7 altered. Uh. So learn your melodic minor. It's a cool um, pitch collection. And uh, a little bit of a caveat. Classical melodic minor and jazz melodic minor are, are different. Um, being classical melodic minor is, is a major scale with a flattened third ascending. So that's C melodic minor ascending. All the letters, but the E's are flat, because the E's are the third. And then descending, it's just a regular C natural minor scale, which is relative to E flat. That's the classical melodic minor scale. The jazz melodic minor scale, we don't, we don't do that changing depending on whatever direction we're going. Uh, it's the same, it's just a major scale with a flat third. Um, so explore the melodic minor. Um, to recap that question, identify um, what uh, notes are in the melody. See if you can't put that in some sort of scale, and then identify using your modal formulas. And study what those modal formulas are, like in relation to minor scales, major scales, um, all of that. Like, what is Dorian? It's a minor scale with a raised sixth degree or a major scale with a flat third and flat seventh what's lydian um it's it's a major scale with a raised fourth what's dorian flat two uh if dorian it's a major scale with a flat third flat seven it'd be a major scale with a flat two flat three and flat seven or a minor scale with a lowered second and then a uh, raised fifth no, sixth. Sorry. Dorian flat two. Um,
And uh, what melodic minor scale does that come out of? Um, or does that come out of a harmonic minor scale? flat too. Uh, I see that mode um, pop up every now, now and again. I, I always forget what it's used for. Um, how uh, My student Ryan asks, how can we play with triads to build chords and ex tritones to build chords and extensions? Um, so this question is a little worded in a little bit of a strange way, but I've got some some ideas that we can you know talk about. First thing we, we should look at is what a tri tritone wants to do. It is not a stable interval. It wants it doesn't want to stay here. It's got a magnetic pole to here. That's resolution. It can also go the other way. We can build chords with with that um, in mind. So that's an E flat seven shell voicing, and I'm, I'm just resolving the outside notes, and then I put this note down. That's a, essentially a tritone substitution five one flat two to one E flat seven to D. Um, Flat seven can also go to uh, um, A flat. That's a five one progression. What other chords contain um, tritones in them? Uh, first thing that pops into my mind is diminished chords. So um, take this uh, B diminished. Tritone right here, and a tritone right here. So that's just two tritones separated by a minor third. If you, you math that out, that's stacking minor thirds. Um, So diminished chords, like if, if we want to use tritones to f learn about chords, we can take a look at the diminished chord, um, which is relationship to four different dominant chords. Lower any of those tones in the B diminished. B, F, D, A double flat, for, for, um, is that A double flat? That's no, just A flat. B, D. Lower any of those tones. Lower the A flat to G. That's G7. Lower the D to uh, E flat. D flat. D flat 7. Lower the F to E. F, uh, E7. Lower the B to B flat. B flat 7. So this works as four different dominant chords with a with a raised 9 or no flatted 9 lower 9 so this is b flat 7 flat 9 um, g7 flat 9 d flat 7 flat 9 and e7 flat 9 um, if we take all of those notes together um, e g b flat D flat, E, G, B flat, D flat. That's another entire diminished chord. And these two uh, diminished chords together 
make up the, the diminished scale that we can use for any of the dominant chords with these roots. So, um, so tritones and chords, um, diminished and dominant like uh that we'll, we'll talk about this um on uh in our next lesson so i can get a little bit more clarification um on, on, on the question you were asking and if any of you want that kind of uh you know uh privilege or curse some might call it you can sign up for lessons with me very very easy um link will be in the description uh or you can just book a lesson like pick a time on my calendar and, and it will send you a zoom link you pay the money it'll send you a zoom link and uh i will be there it'll show up on my phone calendar that you booked the lesson just we live in the future um chord shapes or modes for reading the fretboard um or is it 50-50? I think that knowing scale positions, I think that's what um, you're referring to when you say modes in my you know, terminology. I think that's a little bit better for, for reading the fretboard um, and, and, and knowing the fretboard. Um, <laughs> If you learn your chord shapes, like that's a major chord. This is also a major chord. That's also a major chord. Those are three different major chords. They all happen to be the major chords in the key of C. So C, F, G, in different inversions. Um, so like this is a major chord. Uh, a lot of guitarists have this problem. They think that this note is the root. It's not the root. It's our bass note. It's our lowest note. It's the voice in the bass. So, when I tell you that this is a C major chord, you put your finger down and you're like, cool, that's C major. Where, where's the C? Like, you gotta know that, like, at, at a, um, you know, at a glance. So this shape, the root is in the middle. So I put this shape down. Here, the root is in the middle. Now, now the chord shape doesn't inform like what the root is, like unless you know that what this note is right here, which is F. Uh, I've got a great exercise for uh, brute forcing the major scale, and I've talked about it ad nauseum, many different avenues. The alphabet game. Play through your positions in C major very important because I am not a police officer I'm not uh, administering a field sobriety test so say you say the alphabet C major no sharps no flats only ascending G G A B C D E F G A B C D E F G A and look at the fingerboard while you're doing that G A B C D E F G A B C D E F G A um, you only have to do it that way A G F E D B A G F E D C B A G. I wasn't thinking the alphabet there. I was actually thinking like what note name is on that fret. Um, because I don't I, I never learned how to say my alphabet backwards. Um, so I mean you could do that. That's a lot of brain power. It's a lot of brain power. Like I, I'm always trying to minimize the actual amount of brain power I have to use. You've said your ABCs um, a bunch, I would hope, when you were a child. Um, um, and you've played through your, your C major scale positions a bunch. So those are two relatively automatic processes, at least they should be. Uh, and you just put them together without having to think too much. Do that enough times, like 10,000 times. Um, 
and you'll start to see, like, oh, when I put my finger down here, that's a, uh, that's an A, uh, also A, G, E, F sharp, A flat. Um, you might be asking, but what about the sharps and flats? If you know where all the natural letters are, sharp, find that natural letter, go up one fret. Flat, find that natural letter, go down one fret. Easy peasy. Um, this is a great question. Uh, how to sustain motivation? Um, this is a very, very deep and almost philosophical question. Uh, and, and I think bef before answering that question, because I, I don't think anybody can answer that question for anybody else. You can only answer that for yourself. Um, but some good questions to ask to help get you there is why am I doing this thing? Why do I love the guitar so much? And really, like, be, be honest with yourself. Um, is, is it a good hobby to, to blow off steam? Do, do you want to become a great rock star? Uh, now that's... Um, you don't have to be very good to blow blow off steam on the guitar. You have to be pretty good and incredibly lucky to to be the next greatest rock star. And a follow up question to that is: Are you willing to put in that work for the possibility with the the great possibility that it doesn't pan out? Like that might not pan out for you. It, it doesn't for over ninety nine percent of people. Um, do you love this thing enough to keep pushing despite that? If you do, uh, I mean, there's your motivation. Um, if you don't, like, reevaluate. Re like, I, I don't love this thing enough to um, practice and practice and dedicate my life to it um, in, in, in the hopes that I get lucky. Um, so maybe I'll just try to put together a band and, and have some fun with, with my friends. Like, the, those questions are, are, are the Im important ones. I, I heard a quote one time, like, the how is not important if the why is strong enough. So identify where your whys are. Like, ask yourself why and what. Um, this, this is the only thing I, I ever foresaw myself doing from the, the, the first ever gig that I got uh, paid at. I was 15 years old and, and I thought I was just get, you know having a good time like got a two hour set uh, with some friends I got to play a, a real show at a real venue and at the end of the night a uh, band leader comes over and says hey here's your cut um, and I did it didn't dawn on me until that moment, like, oh, you can get money for playing music. And, and that feeling is the feeling I've been chasing for the past almost 20 years. Acquiring money for music and music-related things. Um, and that, that's been enough to motivate me. Like, even when, you know, I've had mentors, like, really dump on me and... and uh, you know, disrespect me. Uh, you know, I have times of, you know, I don't feel too great about that. I, I let that pass, and then all of a sudden I want to practice again. Uh, I just want to have the guitar in my hands again. And, and I, I figured out how to, you know, lead that into practice. <clears throat> I have clear ideas of the sounds I want to... Um, come out of my instrument so I spent a lot of time figuring out how to create exercises that um, can incorporate the sounds that I want so the so the desire to get those sounds under my fingers is motivation enough for me to practice all right um, 
easiest way to memorize the fretboard. Um, I went over that, the alphabet game. I, I, I think it's the, the simplest. It's not necessarily easy. It's not necessarily quick. But play the alphabet game. You'll build uh, the white keys of the piano on the fretboard. Um, how do you solo in a major key? Um, that's a good question. I, I imagine you're real, real good. The minor pentatonic scale. That same scale is relative to major. So, this is E minor pentatonic. E minor is relative to G major. So, we can play uh, uh, E minor pentatonic over G major. Um, and, and people will, you know, give you scales and things like that. Like, oh, play this scale. It's cool. Play the major scale. Um, the, the, the caveat is you need things to do with said scale. <clears throat> Best place to start. Scales and thirds. That's a building block for so many other things. If we play our thirds and stack another third on top, that gives us our triads in the key. I don't usually practice them uh, uh, straight ascending like that. I usually do something like... So that's the, the triads in, in the G major scale. You also have your diatonic seventh chords. Like you can play all sorts of ideas with, with those, like playing a G major chord. Like I can play a B minor seven arpeggio. Play um, B minor seven into a, a scale fragment, and then <clears throat> soprano pedal point, which is playing a note and then uh, going down or up the scale. against that pedal note. So D, C, D, B, D, A, D, G, D, F sharp, D, G, D, A, D, B, D, C. You can do that for many notes. That's cool. Um, so, and, and that that's just two ideas so far, really. Thirds, pedal point. <clears throat> Rhythms. Small rhythms, like learn how to put those exercises in small ryth rhythmic ideas, like two eighth notes and an eighth rest. You can just play the scale straight up. One and two and three and four and... Might be helpful to count along with. One and two and three and four and one and two and three and four and one and two and three and four and one and two and three and four. Screwed it up there at the end. Um, do that with a metronome to, to hear against um, the uh, against the beat. Um, Mm -hmm. 
things like like triplets, triplet two eighth notes. Da 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 da. Two, three, four. Da 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 da. Two triplets or three triplets, two eighth notes, eight breast. See if I can do that. Let's do eighth rest, eighth note. Da 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 da. Also with the the exercises, I like the scales and thirds. So some melodic ideas, some rhythmic ideas. Like practice that, you'll have no problem soloing over a major key. Um, best way to play the changes of a bird blues measures five through eight. So um, actually prepared for this question a little bit. Bird blues, we'll just play through the form. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two. So it's it's a 12 bar form, but instead of it doesn't start on the dominant chord like a regular blues. Um, it starts on a major chord, and then we've got a 2-5, minor 2-5 to the 6, and then a 2-5 to the 4 chord. And here's bar 5, so it's a 4 chord, major. And then it goes into a series of descending two fives. Four minor, flat seven dominant. Um, three minor, six dominant, flat three minor, flat six dominant, two, five, one. So, this is a very common move. Uh, especially on the four chord, a major chord moving to a minor chord, the same root. So, being able to play that, uh, play ideas over that um, movement is going to be helpful here. Um, so, when playing changes, trying to improvise over changes, the, the easiest way you can spell it out is playing the notes that change. What notes change between these two chords? Uh, B flat, D, F, A, B flat, D flat, F, A flat. Those notes become those notes. So, really accentuating um, that this note goes to here. This note goes to here. And that minor four or flat seven um, uh, dominant, I think of those as very, very similar. Um, uh, So, so a lot of times, like I'll just think B flat minor, and then going to A minor, and, and since <clears throat> that movement is happening, I, I, I wouldn't. I, I wouldn't be as opposed to playing an A minor 9. It's a 3 chord. So usually on the 3 chord you don't include a natural 9, but playing B flat 9, E flat 13, it's nice voice leading. Um, and 
so we've just got, we can think of that as three descending minor chords. We can play the same phrase, um, just descending in half steps. <laughs> So. I've got a loop. Um, that's not the loop um, of, of like the last eight ish of a bird blues. Um. that um, two, 2 5 um, in G flat. It's essentially a tritone substitution. Um, um, D minor, G7. So one way we could think of that, that progression uh, is B flat, E flat, D7, Let's let's see what happens if if I if I'm thinking that way. I'm, I'm simp what I'm doing here is simplifying the changes. started thinking, you know, back to that minor descending rather than uh uh <clears throat> So, like simplifying the changes when you can um, and looking for like linear ideas. Like can you simplify it into something more common? Which would be like, you know, Flat seven dominant, six two dominant, then two five one, or four four minor, three flat three minor, two. Um, simplify when you can um, and look at what notes are changing uh, from chord to chord. And you also asked uh, High May's guitar. I think your name is Juan. Um, how to do more melodical voice keep leading when comping behind someone. Um, this is a very, very um, like nuanced subject. If you're playing with a piano player, the answer is don't. <laughs> unless, unless the piano player stops playing, then you can start get more creative with your chords. But we'll just assume like you're playing like in a um, trio setting. Um, knowing common chords that, that move next to each other and knowing all the voicings, like C major 7 um, to A minor 7 to D minor 7 to G7.
So a lot of what I'm thinking about is, like I've practiced many two fives. And the two fives, like the specific voicings that go next to each other. Like this D minor seven goes to this G seven or this G seven. And this G seven goes to this C major seven or um, this C six or this C chord. Knowing where each chord is supposed to go. And, th and then, like, we have a lot of play with what we can do on the top note. So, if I want to create something linear. So I'm moving up in half steps when I can. D7. And then I'm playing these notes from the G7, but I move this up a half step. That gives me G7 sharp 9 without the root. And then that goes nicely to this C major 7. And then this would be A7. I've already played that specific voicing, um, A7 sharp 9. So I can play A7 sharp 9 sharp 5. I, I suppose I could play a uh, D minor major seven, but I just opted to instead of forego. I, I opted to forego the half step. Just went up a whole step. Um, went a whole step up here too. D minor, G seven, and then it's actually an E minor seven, but E minor seven uh, is spelled E G B D. C major 7 is spelled C E G B. So they have three notes in common. And actually, C major 9 is has an entire E minor 7 in it. So this is a rootless C major 9. I can put a melodic line um, I can move from inversion to inversion as well um, so move to inversion from inversion to inversion with some sort of melodic line that fits in the key or over the, the current uh, chord. Um, so really it comes to knowing your inversions and knowing what chord goes where. That is um, that's gonna be a major help in um, helping you comp more melodically. Like all of that was drop twos except for the, some of the stuff I was doing down here other common shapes. Like you can get wild with this, but um, without knowing your inversions, you're, you're likely to be lost. So, um, stepwise motion. Um, oh, one more thing is you can try to keep the top note the same. So, C major 7, A minor 7, D minor 7. G7, this note is not in G7, so this note um, can go down. You can almost suspend it.
Yeah, all of that was was one six two five. So, get that under your fingers. Um, that's all the questions. Um, thank you for 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 those of you who asked the questions. Um, I'm going to be doing this once a week. Uh, I, I hope I hope to be doing this once a week. Um, but I appreciate you listening to the podcast. Um, again, if you're not subscribed, if you found this for some reason, like, thank you. I'm glad you're here. I'm glad you've listened to the end. That's crazy. Um, hit the hit the subscribe button if you haven't, or follow on, on, on Spotify or whatever platform you listen to podcasts. Um, available for one-on-one and group lessons. Um, yeah, I, th- I think that's uh, that's a show. We did the show. Uh, Keep keep the questions coming, and we will uh, discuss. We will we'll keep uh, uh, trying to acquire more knowledge. But until then, practice. <laughs>